you, Richard. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to this IDS member seminar, um, which is um, chaired by me, and also I'll be presenting, co-presenting with colleagues from Haiti. I'm very happy they managed to come all the way. So uh, Ebert Artus will be um, co-presenting today, and then also we have Stephen Werlin from Foncose in Haiti to join us for the discussion afterwards. And we are going to talk about research in Haiti called Pathways to Stronger Futures, trying to assess how economic strengthening and whether economic strengthening can support early childhood development. Um, so as usual in the seminars, there'll be a presentation of about 40 minutes, which we will share our kickoff. Um, and then Ebert will talk more about the Haiti and the program context for which we did the research. And then um, I'll come back in to talk about the findings before we open up for discussion. So as background, this research started from the acknowledgement of ECD um, still being a very global challenge. Uh, so recent research in the Lancet looked at um, how many children, the proportion of children that are still um, challenged in ECD, and it's a high proportion. So globally, in low- and middle-income countries, 43% of children aged 0 to 5 are not reaching their developmental potential. And in this case, that's based on living in extreme poverty and also being malnourished. Now, the very high regional differences so the proportions of children at risk are highest in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it's about 66%, and lowest in the region that we're looking at, Latin America and Caribbean, 18%. But as we will see when we come to the Haiti country context, this is very much a regional average that in this case doesn't, doesn't really apply. But to say it's a global challenge, one that is also acknowledged in the SDGs, so SDG 4 around quality education is the SDG that explicitly mentions early childhood development, but the other SDGs such as uh, number 2 on, on hunger and nutrition, on health, and number 1 on poverty of course also very relevant to ensuring good early childhood development. And so against this backdrop of the importance of ECD in the global development debate, but the challenge that is out there, the um, British Academy, through the Global Challenges Research Fund, put out an ECD research program two years ago that focused particularly on research that tried to um, get an understanding of how programs might improve ECD, and particularly looking at programs that are not necessarily focused on ECD as their primary objective. So any other kinds of interventions that might affect young children's lives, um, but not necessarily with uh, the components of ECD uh, at its, the core of its theory of change. And so with that in mind, we put in a proposal that looked at the potential of graduation programs as a particular program of comprehensive social protection and the way in which it's uh, supporting economic strengthening to see how it can affect early childhood development. Now, I know many of you in the room just had um, a lecture and seminars about graduation, but just as a recap, graduation programs, um, they started in Bangladesh with, uh, with Brack's model and are based on the understanding that People living in extreme poverty need a big push to move out of poverty in a sustainable way. So if you could bring them over a certain threshold, they would then be able to, to enter sort of virtuous cycle out of poverty. And this big push consists of different components. And, and very often um, they are a combination of, of consumption assistance, so that's, that's sort of a regular uh, cash transfer that helps with day-to-day -day consumption needs. It would be access to financial services, so this could be um, savings and lendings group within the community, for example. It would often be seed capital, not so often employment, but mostly in the form of asset transfers, so livestock or any other assets to set up um, income generating activities. And then quite crucially also these two components of training and mentoring. So, those who are in the program are accompanied for a certain period of time alongside receiving the economic and material support. And this happens over a, a time-bound period 
So often programs um, are between about 18, 24, sometimes 36 months. And that's when the support comes to an end. And ideally, everybody will have received the required push. They started in Bangladesh, but they have uh, rapidly expanded. Um, so this is a, a map that has sort of dots indicating where these types of interventions are taking place. Uh, when this map was drawn, there were um, interventions in 34 countries, and I believe at present it, it's already up to about 43. Now, many of these started as small-scale um, pilot um, projects that were implemented by NGOs, but more and more there are connections to governments to build them into social protection systems. So against this background, the main question for the research was how economic strengthening through these types of programs, comprehensive, we can see them as a type of comprehensive social protection, can promote childhood development and ultimately break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. Um, so how can programs that do not have ECD at its core objective contribute to ECD or are there other mechanisms um, that might be at play that actually might cause some, some negative effects. In framing the research and thinking about ECD, we use the nurturing care framework. So this is a framework that was put out about um, two years ago um, to engage with this challenge of, of early childhood development and the fact that so many children are at risk of uh, not reaching their potential. And it frames um, ECD within five components, uh, sort of intuitive to understand and um, to also link different uh, program interventions too. So the first one is good health. The second is around adequate nutrition, responsive caregiving, uh, security and safety, and opportunities for early learning. There's some discussion about the age bracket that this refers to. So uh, sometimes ECD like in the data we saw, refers to children aged 0 to 5. Um, this framework um, in the documentation actually refers to the even younger children aged 0 to 3. For our research, we took the wider age bracket, so aged 0 to 5. And alongside that, this is at the, in the outcome, more in the outcome area, we also looked at what some of the key key risk factors are that can cause poor early childhood development. And this follows from earlier literature, um, also mostly within the Lancet. Um, and many of these don't, don't come as a surprise. The big one is poverty. So that's obviously where we would see a role of economic strengthening. Um, and related um, is maternal stress and poor health. So if mothers are, um, uh, have poor uh, both physical and mental health, um, that seem to, to correlate quite strongly with poor um, developmental outcomes for children. Exposure to violence as well, and then more generally lack of public services. So we try to touch on these in the research to see uh, how the program touches on these risk factors and also these outcome areas. And before we, we went out and um, developed some of the research tools and started the data collection and the um, analysis, we did some thinking about the potential pathways of impact to get an understanding of what we are trying to, to get at. And the first one is um, the most obvious one, an income effect. We would expect the programs to have a positive effect on early childhood development through the increase in income. Um, and that's both income received directly as people are parts taking in the program, as well as additional income raised through income generating activities or economic, um, economic strengthening. And this increase in income has a direct effect, so it allows families to purchase more, to meet basic needs for children, but also an indirect effect in relation to that stress factor. So it can improve um, the relationships between children and caregivers and overall um, give caregivers a better opportunity to, to, to care for their children. So this is where we expected to see quite a big um, um, impact. 
But we also expected to see a training effect. So training and mentoring was, uh, is a big uh, component within these programs. And uh, we considered this to be, to be quite important, particularly because the program that we are looking at, as we will hear about in a minute, has quite strong messages around issues that are particularly relevant for children. So there are messages around health, uh, sanitation, and also nutrition. That's not necessarily the case for all these programs. So some programs are really quite narrowly focused on economic strengthening and focus their mentoring and training more on the economic activities. In our case, we do, um, or we did expect to see a training effect. But at the same time, we were also very aware that there is the risk that there might be a trade-off between the increase in economic activities and the quality of care that caregivers can provide for children. Um, and this concern originates from the work that's been done on um, women's economic empowerment and, and the balancing of paid and unpaid care work. And of course, that's an issue for women involved, but also for the children that they care for, which is interestingly not often something that features into the, in the conversation. So the extra step towards children um, hasn't often been taken. So we expected to see a gendered increase in the burden of paid work and unpaid work, again in this program also because the program targets particularly women. And that might undermine um, the quality care for, for children. Now, we are working on um, sort of an overview of the evidence that, that's there, um, not quite a systematic review, but almost. And uh, fortunately for us, as the, the researchers, we can see that the evidence is scarce. So we are onto something in terms of this research. Um, so when we look at the studies that are available in terms of um, impact evaluations of these types of graduation programs that have looked at any type of outcome regarding early childhood development, well, all, firstly, there's not all that many. So there's about 27 studies that we found that touch upon any of these outcome areas. Um, and when we look at across these five different areas of the nurturing care framework, there's um, quite a few, a bit more than half the studies looking at some form of nutrition or food security. Uh, but then it, it drops off quite quickly. Some in health, but the other three are barely considered. So no, nothing on responsive caregiving, nothing on early learning. The studies do, however, look more at, at school enrollment. So it's not really surprising. It's not surprising because the indicators that are included in the evidence base are indicators that are more commonly included in evaluations. And also it's not surprising because these programs are not focused on ECD. So why would they include indicators on ECD, particularly the, the more softer areas, if you will, in their impact evaluations? Of course, that's not to say that we shouldn't find out about it. So that's, that's what we did with this study. Okay, moving on to the case study, um, Haiti and then particularly the program. So, as I said, um, Latin America and the Caribbean region was lowest in terms of the risk of children uh, not reaching their potential. But when we look at the country case for Haiti, that looks quite different. So, poverty is high. This is more than 60% more than of all children live in, in poverty, so more than half and also percentages of extreme poverty are, are high. Malnutrition is also relatively high, with one in five children under five being stunted, um, and also widespread child mortality. So if we're looking at a case in a country context where we really need to make progress with respect to ECD, Haiti certainly is, is, is that context. Now we focused on one particular program, the CLM program in Haiti, um, and I'm going to hand over to Hebert to tell you about the program, as he's the program director, so it's far Could better place. Tell us yeah. How you're measuring economic strengthening, or what do you even mean by it? So, in this case, Sorry. in this case, we would mean the ability to earn an income, particularly in, for women more individually, independently, rather than being dependent on their spouses or other family members. Economic strengthening we use is quite a broad term, and also we've had some conversations um, with the, the colleagues from Foncose 
what that means in different programs because we also found that in the, in the CLM program that means something different than in other graduation programs uh, depending on what kinds of activities they promote. Okay, good afternoon. And I'm going to, to talk about CLM programs. So first, uh, sorry for my English. Um, I'm a French speaker. My English is not so good. So I'll try anyway. So <clears throat> Foncose is one of the, oh, it's the biggest microfinance institution in Haiti. So Mainly, Foncose provide microloans to, to a group of women in rural uh, country. But after five or six years of operation in microfinance, and Foncose determined that it fails to save extra poor families. And that for many reasons. First of all, ext extreme, extreme poor families doesn't have enough confidence to to run a business and make it profitable and pay, pay the loan back. And other thing, taking a credit in group means that you have other people who trust you who can make a group with you and take the loan. And extreme poor families in Haiti doesn't really have that confidence in the community to have people who trust them, make a group with them to take a loan. So, This is why Foncose tried to establish, establish TCREDI and CLM program. TCREDI was a soft, soft, soft loan, and after evaluation, we still discovered that TCREDI doesn't fit extreme poor families, and we come with CLM, which is an adaptation of BRAC model. And that's the component of the program. That's basically the same component of, of, of BRAC program with some adaptation. So for the selection, we have the selection, the economic and social development, health intervention, and graduation. So yeah, when we're talking about extreme poor families, it's like people who, who instead of those criteria you see, it's, it's some people also who, who live day by day, who doesn't really have a future plan. They, they don't picture themselves in the future, they work today, they eat. They don't work, they don't eat. They don't save, and they are living in in a context where basic facilities in, for health, education, and job doesn't really exist. So, for the economic development, so the the. The main focus on that, it's, 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 so what we need to understand, it's like working with those families in a context where there is nothing available. So we need to have a comprehensive approach. So first, we, we focus on de developing income generating activities, but it's not enough because they need some accompaniment. So in, instead of work program, if you, if you look at here, you see we have, in, we have home improvement. We have a kind of emergency, emergency funds because sometimes for death or to pay to, even they get access to the, 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 the health is free, but paying to get access to the paying the transportation to go to, to health facilities, so paying for funerals, something like that, we need to, to, to add something like emergency fund. So other thing it's really important to us because it's not, it's not like the community exclude those people, they exclude themselves also. So this is why we, we work with community development committee. And Community Development Committee, it's, it's key for us because in those committees, they, they start to, to learn uh, 
the, some lead, leadership skills, but also they try to make connection. As I told at the beginning, they don't have people who trust them. They don't, they don't have friends. So in this local committee, they get, they get into contact with other people so they can better progress. And other thing it's key for us, it's the same thing for practice, the weekly visit by a case manager. Uh, we have a case manager who, who visit them once a week. And during that visit, they, they not only make follow up on enterprise development, or, but also to see if there is any need to go to the hospital, if there is children to go to school, or they sent back to school. So the case manager play a central role in the progress of seller members. So you see a productive asset and weekly stipend. It's quite the same as Brack model. For health, what is important to understand is like for those families, access doesn't mean you have the facility available and then go there, they receive you. Access means also the ability to navigate inside those facilities. So that was a big, big challenge for, for, for them because when they go to, to the health center, they, they cannot navigate inside. So see the doctor, or go to the lab, and go to the drugstore. So we, we, had, we, we, we have nurses sometimes we'll go to the facilities to train them how to use it so they can continue to use it in the future. That's really, really important to understand. And other thing also, it's malnutrition screen, screening because it's really, really common because they, they, they face challenge to, to get food uh, at the household. So it's something we, we have a close, really close follow up on it. Every six months we, we did my nutrition screen, screen, screaming to see what happened. And on top of that, we have a bunch of messages regarding hygiene and family planning and some basic disease. So to say health intervention for us, it's first for prevention about message on hygiene or good practice in health, and also for treatment because every member has an insurance card so they can go to some health center we have partnership with. They don't have to pay for, 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 for the care. And we, <clears throat> we have a system to monitor weekly the progress of those members. So we have case managers who go to, to do follow up and see the progress, whether there's something to, to add to correct or whether there's something to, to work on. We have supervisors to do quite the same thing, not only follow up, follow how case managers work, but also follow the progress on the member. And we have also sector specialists who, who go to, to those families just to do follow up. But on top of that, we have three set evaluation. One at six months to see how fast they are progressing. Another one at, at 12 months, it's to see where they are regarding the graduation criteria. And a last one at 17 months, just to see if they are graduate or not. And graduation for us means they can at least have one hot meal a day. They can pay for school fees for their children. They, 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 they have at least two sources of income. And they have a growth in, in the asset base at, at least 40%. So graduation means that. And we, 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 we did that. We do that evaluation at 17 months. And what we understood, we understood that this, this program is, 
it's not like something easy for an NGO or a, 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 priv a private organization to do because we are working in a context where services are not available. So we engage in a kind of advocacy to see whether we can have state government jump into that, that mechanism to, to address extreme poverty in Haiti. So prior to that advocacy work, now that's a, that's, 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 that's a win for us because now the, 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 the national framework of social, protect, social, social protection and social promotion, the national framework integrate the concept of ultra poverty because previously they just have, they just talk about poverty, poverty. It's like every poor are at the same level. But our experience showed that the ultra, ultra poor doesn't really need the same intervention as, as a poor family. So the national framework get it and now they integrate, they, they, they are trying it's like World Food Program work with state government to design a national policy of social protection and social promotion. And graduation approach is one of the mechanisms they adopt to for a, they, they adopt for, for, for the next few for, for the next for the common years. But you know, sometime in Haiti and so many poor countries, they have policies, but no actions. So we understood that that will take time to have state go deeply in, in, in that mechanism to, 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 to face extreme poverty in Haiti. This is why we provide, we, we are providing technical assistance to local organization, local NGO to do also, to integrate also graduation approach in the in 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 the work and we we have few organizations we, we work with now and we we're looking to 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 have more local organizations so we can go and work with them joy to to try to address extreme poof extreme poverty through the graduation approach so it's a 18 month program, 18 month full accompaniment. And that's what we do in Haiti. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Ben. Okay, so you know about the program. I'm going to talk you briefly through the data and the methodology and then to, I would say, our interesting research findings. So, first off, I should clarify that this piece is an entirely qualitative uh, part of, of the research. So, we collected data in three sites in central Haiti, so um, roughly within the um, circle that's on the map. Um, and we roughly tried to divide these in remote, less remote, and, and not so remote areas. And within that, within each of these three sites, we focused our data collection um, efforts on eight case studies, so 24 case studies overall, um, with CLM members, so that's how the program participants are referred to, and these are women, um, and in this case, for the purposes of this research, women with young children aged between zero or five. Um, as part of these case studies, we did a lot of different activities with the individual women as well as with their spouse or one other main caregiver of the children if there was no spouse available. And in addition to that, we, we, we had focus group discussions or group activities, 10 in each site, and also interviews with, with staff of the CLM program. So some of the activities that we did um, are um, body mapping, 
Um, we did a scoring exercise of the different components of the program. We did community mapping, seasonal calendar, daily activity clock, um, all these kinds of exercises in, uh, when relevant individually and in groups to try and build up a picture, not necessarily really zooming in on the impact of the program, on children, but more generally understanding what are the caregiving practices, what are the attitudes towards um, um, nutrition, health, responsive caregiving. Because when we were designing the data collection tools, we also felt that we don't really have enough information about that in Haiti at the moment. Um, and so together, this builds up a picture to come to an understanding of uh, the main research question. Now, just to say that this is complemented by a quantitative impact evaluation. In fact, we started this research by um, um, doing a baseline of this group of uh, women in the program in um, April, June 2017, so two years ago. And when we were doing the training of the baseline surveys, that's when we saw the opportunity for this piece of research. So it's worked out quite nicely time-wise because we did the baseline that's helped us to understand some of the dynamics within the, uh, within the sites. Um, we've completed this qualitative study now, and as we speak, the team is in the field to collect the end line data. And so over the summer, we'll be analyzing the quantitative data, and we can use that in, um, in line with the qualitative data to really also get numbers attached to some of these questions. So what's important to keep in mind when I go to, through the findings here is that they are all based on qualitative findings, particularly in the beginning. I'm going to talk about effects in the different components of the nurturing care framework. That's all based on women's own perceptions and their spouse's own perceptions of how things have changed. So it's not in relation to observable or um, survey-based indicators. So in going through the findings, I'm going to quickly talk about the effects on elements of nurturing care, um, then some of the findings in relation to those pathways of impact that we hypothesized, and then challenges of some of the emerging themes, which really I think is where the, the interesting elements of the research uh, come out. So findings regarding um, the program's effects or roles in nurturing care. I start with talking about health and nutrition um, because in line with where the evidence is available, we also see this is where the program, based on the respondents, has the biggest effect or where it's been seen to have quite a, a you know, substantial role. So with respect to health, there was a notion that the program helps to, helps to reduce the risk of illness through better sanitation, having access to clean drinking water, better sanitation practices, and also access to healthcare. So like Hebert said, the program provides malnutrition screening, but also um, access to um, a, a hospital that's in the vicinity and, and allows for free healthcare. The program also strengthens food security for children, and I quite explicitly put food security here and not, not nutrition, because we can't really observe the nutritional outcomes. So respondents report more meals, better dietary diversity, um, and less hunger, but whether or not that translates into less malnutrition, um, we, we cannot necess necessarily say. So from across these five components, this is where the impact, the role of the program stood out. When we look at security and safety, um, we see the potential for a, a modest effect. So actually one of the things that were, as it was mentioned, um, most frequently in relation to um, safety and security was having access to better housing. So the provision of housing materials is part of the program and the encouragement of building a house is. So many um, women over the course of the program period were able to build a house with proper walls and a, and a proper roof that keeps sort of the, the sun and, and the rain out, but also um, provide secure shelter for themselves and for their children. We saw a little bit of this um, indirect income effect as well, um, as well as training effect, I should say, uh, with the program contributing to more secure relationships, particularly between women and spouses. 
there was a question mark around disciplining practices. So um, some women said that they had been informed by the case managers that it's better to speak to your child if they're naughty or not behaving well. Um, but in other cases, uh, spanking children or corporal punishment um, was also advocated. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And then finally, very limited impact in terms of early learning and responsive caregiving. So responding to a child when they, when they are upset or when they sort of, um, visibly show that they are in need of something. There's generally good knowledge of breastfeeding, the need to breastfeed and soothing infants when they are upset, so particularly young babies. Um, and also uh, to talk and sing and, and play with infants. So in this case, that means really young infants, so up to sort of one year of age. And that's because the program also includes messages about the importance of talking to your child when they're very young. Now the response shifts quite a lot once children start talking and once children start moving around. Um, and so the response becomes a lot more um, punitive and especially the soothing aspect, but also the more playful aspect um, of being with children uh, gets far less attention. Um, there is improved school attendance for all the children, but we wouldn't really consider that to be part of ECD. And unfortunately, nothing in terms of um, early childhood development services, though of course we wouldn't really expect that as part of this program. So overall, definitely the program plays a role in supporting good development of young children, particularly in the areas where we already knew that that was the case, nutrition, health, far less so in other areas. But then again, that's not necessarily surprising as the program includes messaging and support around nutrition, health, sanitation, far less around early learning um, and also responsive caregiving. Now digging into some of the pathways to impact, we find that the income effect, or I should really say the material effect, was most prominent in responses to the question, what do you think is most important or how, how does the program help you to support taking care of children? So we did this scoring exercise, asking uh, respondents to um, score with the use of beans, how um, relatively important they found certain components are. Um, and sort of the darker um, components here are almost all referred to, to the material aspects. So um, housing is important, the livestock, so the asset transfer that, that they receive, the cash stipends but also the water filter. But it's very much sort of the, the material support that came up um, in people's minds first. And many responses about um, how the combination of that has helped starting a business, how having livestock helps to um, multiply livestock and earn money, but also supports child care in terms of a buffer when any shocks occur. We also find evidence for this training effect. So the importance of having these case managers go to the households every week, as a bear said, and speak primarily with the mothers of children um, about, on the one hand, about issues regarding the economic strengthening component and how to build the business, how to rear livestock, but also all these other messages, some of which are more particularly focused on children. So this quote focuses... Uh, uh, primarily on family planning messages and how important that was. Uh, but this picture shows uh, Jenny Floor and her young son, Bosco, who suffered malnutrition when she was in the program. And she says that the support uh, that she received, both in terms of the plumpy nuts, as well as advice about dietary diversity, really helped improve his health and his nutritional status. But what also comes out quite strongly in these responses is that it's very difficult to single these things out and that there is quite a large synergy effect. And so this is where we really find the qualitative discussions helpful because within evaluations of these kinds of programs, there's so much focusing on trying to single out how the different components add to um, overall impact. This actually shows it's quite difficult to do that. It's all these things coming together that um, provides women with, with the material. So this is a water filter that allows for cleaning, um, 
providing clean water. The explanation of how it works, the help of um, mending it if it's broken. Um, and all that together sort of affords the experience of drinking clean water, making sure that you have clean water, and also seeing that children become uh, ill far less often. So mother's reports, yes, I've seen the water filter help uh, my child have less diarrhea. Um, and so there's far greater chance for this to then be continued in the future. Um, so in trying to understand these different pathways, we've tried to distinguish between the income effect and training effect, and sometimes that's worked out well, but often in the responses we find that women also lump it together, as we can see in this quote. It's, it's a synergy of everything. Okay, then coming to some of the challenges or some of the themes that emerged um, across looking um, at caregiving practices, the role of the program, etc. The first one around this, this uh, work and care um, balance or trade-off, which we found was definitely a concern for many, many women who were in the program. So this is um, Angeline. She has four young children. And she really struggles to combine the, the work and particularly the caring for the livestock that she's received with caring for her children and particularly the youngest one um, that, she, that she's carrying around. Um, and so when we asked women, you know, how does the work, the paid work particularly that you do affect the care that you provide for children, um, a frequent response was that they found it difficult to um, combine it and to find care for their children uh, when they are away from the home. Um, and so common responses um, were that they worry about their children getting dirty and not being fed well, uh, getting injured or, or, or um, you know, being in harm's way. And that's because sometimes they are left with neighbors or community members and they don't necessarily entirely trust these neighbors or community members, but often children are also left to their own devices with younger siblings. Um, so uh, this is a, a five-year-old sibling uh, that would then take care of this um, little boy. Um, and part of the reason why um, um, these things are, are complicated <coughs> is uh, the gendered roles and responsibilities around who takes care of children. So it's definitely a woman's job to, to, um, to be the primary caregiver. And interestingly, the program, the interaction with the program almost inadvertently complicates the matter because the program is very powerful in um, advocating for the fact that women have their own agency, they have their own... Um, uh, economic power, if you will, but at the same time, they're also seen as a central pillar of, of household life. So these are, um, these are um, sort of excerpts from CLM songs that are sung uh, throughout the program, just as an illustration of how these, um, the positive and also the challenging comes together in the messaging around the agency that women have, but also the expectation that they're supposed to be doing it all at the same time. Now, women didn't necessarily explicitly say, that's a problem for me, because they hold on quite tight to their identity as primary caregivers as well, and take on um, the new identity of being um, an economic agent. Um, they take that on with both hands. But once you start asking about how they combine these things, how they feel at the end of the day in terms of their physical well-being and their mental well-being, it comes out that it's actually really quite a struggle um, to do everything, meeting their own expectations, meeting others' expectations, and also providing the care for, the, for their children that they're happy with. A very particular thing in Haiti is that there is also um, concerns around evil, evil eye or, or bad spirits that adds to the complication. So this is the photo from Angeline again, and as you can see, she's carrying her child um, in her arm, the front of her body, um, and that's to avoid that there are any bad spells or curses cast on the children. And of course, that makes it really difficult if you were to combine any work with 
carrying your child. So it's impossible for women to go to the market or go out to the field, do anything really, um, whilst also um, carrying their child, which is different um, from, from other contexts. Um, and it also makes it more difficult to look into childcare arrangements because there's very little trust in the community of others. So there's generally the circle, the social network, if you will, of people that they can rely on to leave their children with is small. It might, it, it's mostly um, mothers, mothers-in-law, or other family members, sometimes neighbors. But if they're not available, it becomes tricky quite quickly. Um, so many responses about how they don't trust neighbors, uh, they're worried about them hurting children, um, in part because of this and in part because they believe that they're not capable of providing adequate care. So there's a real question there programmatically how to, how to um, come to terms with that because um, in other programs, childcare options are being integrated, but here that's quite difficult. Um, then in terms of the limited impacts on safety and security, there are some um, challenges regarding norms uh, with respect to play and disciplining. So as I said before, um, when the babies are very small, that seems to be okay. As they grow older, both um, the play elements is sort of um, like this quote says, you can't be too comfortable with your child. There always needs to be this element of slight fear for your parents so they don't become too rowdy. Um, and then widespread um, norms about uh, corporal punishment. Now we had interesting conversations um, when we uh, had meetings in Haiti last month with the staff around norms of corporal punishment um, that we may come back to um, uh, after the presentation. Other challenges um, exist around building good relationships or having good relationships, which it was clear from this research, but also research that's been done on the program previously are central to success. So success to the economic strengthening, but also for childcare. One of those key relationships is between the woman and their spouse. Um, and as one supervisor within the program framed it, in their years of experience working with women and their spouses, they see three different types of relationships. Um, so the best one is a cooperative husband, um, and that means that women are, can be seen as fast climbers, which is one of the things that comes out of the evaluation data, so they make, make good progress. But if they have a husband that's either disruptive or disengaged, um, then that means that women don't make as much progress, and quite a lot of effort goes into sort of navigating the disputes and um, um, making sure that either the spouse doesn't disrupt things or um, um, trying to get them on board with, with some of the training, etc. Now, the program can help. So this is uh, Madeleine, and um, she explained how the case manager of the program intervened to help resolve some of the struggles she's had with her spouse, Peterson, in trying to get him on board with some of the income-generating activities. <clears throat> so this is where we see the program having a, a positive role. But there is also um, a challenge in securing the good relationship between the member and the case manager. So the case managers come out as being central to the program and its effects. Um, but not necessarily for everybody. So this is a case of Samantha, um, and she indicated she struggled quite a bit to build rapport with her case manager, felt uh, that she wasn't understood, um, and in the end moved out of the village where she was participating in the program to find other means of work. Of course, that's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship, um, but it definitely contributed. So overall, many people refer to case managers as a friend, as a father, as, a, um, as an uncle or teacher. Um, others said that they were worried about them getting angry. Not necessarily a black and white divide. So as this quote indicates, um, at first there was a bit of fear um, of the case manager, but then at the end when there was progress made, that was sort of okay. Um, Nevertheless, it's, it's clear that not for all women it's necessarily a positive relationship. And then finally, um, it's just 
important to highlight that all of this takes place in the context of lack, where there's extreme lack of basic social services. So um, in that sense, it's a real, a real challenge for CLM program to affect positive change because um, there are no EC services, water is an issue, also accessibility to some of these areas is an issue. So the program has built links to health services quite successfully, um, but that's not necessarily integrated into a, a government system. So to sum up, Programs that support economic strengthening like this one can definitely um, support early childhood development and there are ways in which program design and delivery can be tweaked to further increase that impact. Now, for those working on graduation program, there is a question, a broader question of how to reconcile that with the primary objective of economic strengthening or uh, reducing poverty and some may, may say, well, it's nice that you can have these positive impacts, but you're, you're building in too much. And if you do that, all of it becomes ineffective. Another clear lesson is that the child sensitive and gender sensitive um, elements of programming are linked. Um, so you have to look at, um, at them in, in conjunction, particularly for young children when, um, when care is such a, a vital uh, a part of their lives. Then the relational dimension comes out strongly. I spoke about spouses, about the case managers. There's also an element of community dynamics. And that's quite important to be acknowledged again within conversations of graduation programs because a lot of the conversation focuses on how to reduce the cost of these quite expensive programs and how to build a minimum package. And finally, um, the question of how to link to basic services and how to integrate these programs more generally within systems of social protection and basic service provision is going to be crucial if um, you know, together they can build on um, um, better outcomes for ECD. So that's almost an hour, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um,